You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market updates and trading strategies. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com and co-hosts, Uncle Mike Tussaw from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster, Joe Venazzi, and Mark the Greasy Meatball, Sebastian from optionpit.com. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the option block for our second show here of 2016. We are, of course, everyone's favorite, hopefully your favorite, bi-weekly source for all things options related. My name is Mark Longo, coming to you from the Options Insider Studios here in the options mecca of the known world, Chicago, Illinois. And of course, we produce a wide array of fine programs here in the old studios, not just Option Block, Vol Views, Advisors Option, our daily options news rundown, Options Playbook Radio, if you want to get a little more into some of the educational stuff, Options Boot Camp, also deep into uh, the educational side, Advisors Option, if you're looking for an advisor or you are an advisor, want to learn how to use options, long and short of futures options, you can probably tell from the title what that one's about, et cetera, et cetera, on for a full baker's dozen or thereabouts for programs I lose track in the new year and more Come in all the time. We're always planning and cooking and coming up with interesting new ideas and retooling some existing stuff and relaunching stuff and all kinds of fun stuff in the work. So stay tuned to the network. The easiest way to do that is just surf on over to theoptionsinsider.com. While you're there, of course, feel free. You know, we're not just radio, folks. We do content on the web. We do written content analysis, a lot of unusual activity, breaking news in the world of options, volume recaps, market share rundowns, analysis, some future stuff thrown in there, some tech stuff, all kinds of fun stuff. You never know what we're going to have until you surf over to the website and find out for yourself. And, of course, while you're there, you can always click on the Insider Radio Network tab, top left corner of the page, and bam, you're good to go all nine years. Yes, I said that right, nine years worth of programming. At your fingertips, listeners. It's quite a daunting amount. We're working on siphoning it for you. Don't worry. But in the meantime, it's up to you guys to find your favorite programs. Or just subscribe to our network feed. Probably the easiest way to get it all. Right there, delivered to whatever device you like. iTunes, whatever platform you like. TuneIn, Stitcher, your iPad, your iPhone, your Android device, your Amazon device. You can even find workarounds. You can use, of course, Stitcher or TuneIn on the Windows phone. Any platform you like. We're available, and of course, you also have our mobile app out there, too. So no shortage of ways for you guys to check out our stuff, maybe find some new stuff and new programs you haven't checked out before. Maybe you didn't know about the futures option stuff or the advisors option stuff or our daily news show. Go check them out. They're pretty fun. And joining me for this pretty fun second episode here of the world melting down 2016, starting off with the man beaming in from the hinterlands of Maine. You know him, you love him as the rock lobster himself. Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi from many different parts of the of the options landscape. Currently, he hangs his hat over there at optionpit.com. Mr. Greasy Meatball, actually, I should say that right, Mr. Rock Lobster, welcome back to the program here for this second episode of 2016. It is good to be back. Just a busy day, busy, busy day. Lots of stuff going on. You say that with such enthusiasm, sir. It is dripping. Dripping from your well, I'm just, I'm, I guess I'm at some point during the day, you just get tired of looking at the market, you know, <laughs> where you go, oh man, <laughs> yeah, listeners. it's moving around a lot. You're trying to get stuff done. Execution's hard. It's all the same problems everybody's got. So not just, just not easy. I guess that's the easy way to say it. It's just not easy. That could be the subtitle for this program. Execution is hard. And a man to help you get your executions done is good old uncle Mike Tussaud. From RCM Wealth Advisors, 
Uncle Mike, happy second show of 2016 and this great global meltdown to you as well. The great global meltdown of 2016. Gotta love it. The weather's cold, but the markets are hot. Well, wait, it's cold in the market. Whatever. Good to be here. Yeah, it's something like that. It all works out as we keep on rolling into our second trading block here of 2016. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody, welcome to The Trading Block. You guys know the drill by now, or hopefully you're doing. If you're just joining us for the first time here in the new year, welcome to you. You picked an interesting time to join us. We are recording this, of course, on Thursday, January 7th, 2016, for all of you guys playing the home game out there, want to follow along. And as I was alluding to there at the top of the show, it is, depending on who you talk to, the end of the world, the the sky is falling, et cetera, et cetera. Yet another down day on the heels of China, just uh, smacking us all yet again. Their market pretty much opening down 7% before their circuit breakers kicking in and causing all sorts of turmoil and havoc over there. That, of course, spilled over here stateside as well. It seemed at first like it may not be uh, be to the same extent as we saw, certainly not percentage-wise, obviously, but it certainly seemed like we may have weathered the storm a decent amount, uh, and then we saw the sell-off kind of exacerbating a bit towards the end of the day before relenting a little bit again here in the final minutes of the session, and we see uh, the S&P closing off its lows, closing about 10 handles off its lows, right around 1948 or so, low about 1938 intraday. day. So not uh, the most dire of closes, but still off over 2% on the day. The Dow off exactly 2%. Uh, the NASDAQ feeling most of the heat off nearly 3% on the day. And surprise, surprise, VIX Cash getting that old aggressive inhale, shall we say, today up nearly four handles at the end of the day, or for those percent of percenters out there, 18, nearly 19 percent, got as high as nearly 26 intraday, about 2586. So flirting with the 26 handle, I can't wait to talk about it on Vol Views uh, tomorrow because no one, no one in our last episode thought any of this was coming. So there's a lot to chat about there. But before we do that, we have to do this show. And there's a lot to chat about here. I want to start with this for both of you guys as we're talking about this, because I've been seeing this freaking everywhere and it's driving me crazy i was kind of joking earlier at the top of the show the market meltdown the end of the world but i've seen this headline i've lost track how many times this week all over the place mainstream things like usa today more targeted areas and out financial outlets as well uh, it's kind of repeating this mantra i'm not sure how this got out there that this is suddenly 2008 all over again that these last couple of sessions we've had literally four days into the new year we are somehow repeating the colossal financial calamity that was 2008 when pretty much every major financial institution was bordering on insolvency and the market was teetering on the brink of recession and indeed depression. And somehow in these four days, yeah, there's some scary stuff coming out of China, but somehow in these four days, people are starting to equate that. And that kind of histrionics really just drives me mad. I'll let you guys weigh in on it. Who knows? Maybe you guys are feeling some of that, 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 those histrionics in your blood. Maybe you're starting to think this is 2008 all over again. Uncle Mike, uh, breathe some sanity to us. Please tell me you're not, you're not buying into all this 2008 hype. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. Oh, wait, sorry. <laughs> I, I thought my mute button was on still. Sorry. <laughs> That's what sorry. you want to hear from your financial advisor, right? Oh, wait, hold on a second. I got a phone call I got to take. Wait, there's plenty of reason to panic. Okay, got to go. Bye. Oh, wait, sorry. Anyway, that's what we've been telling our people today, that there's plenty of reason to panic. The sky is falling. And uh, when in danger or in doubt, uh, run in circles, scream and shout. So those are my solutions for the day. No. Um, no, with today, this is one where you just have to be respectful of the marketplace. We've come gotten used to the bull markets over the course of the last few years. <coughs> Excuse me. And with a bull market comes a pullback at times. Now you can argue and say maybe we already had our pullback last August, even though it was a quick, fast pullback. Um, we got probably another 30 or so points to go before we're 10% off of the all-time high in the S&P again. Uh, so you could argue that maybe that would be a number of some sort. Who knows? But here's the bottom line with it. What we've been doing so far this year 
and the SPY diagonal spread slash put spread account, so to speak, the S&P is down, uh, or SPY is down about $10 on the year. We're down about $1.80. So is that ideal? No, but being constant bulls and the fact that we've lost only 20% of the downside, we're actually very happy with that. So what I recommend that people do when the market gets negative on the year, pull in your horns, be a lot more conservative. I'm not saying don't do anything, uh, but what I am saying is be a little bit more conservative. And then once the market goes green, uh, then at that stage, put a little bit more on the table or uh, maybe when have, have your own marks to where when the market goes down 10% on the year, then maybe you look to get back in and buy the dip or 20%, whatever the case may be. May be, but have some type of a plan no matter what happens. Uh, with our macro hedges, so to speak, uh, for our strategic night portfolio, along with our just uh, SPY positions, uh, we're hedged down through the 185 level in S&P. Uh, granted, it's not going to be that exactly right now. It's not going to be a full hedge because there's still theta left in them dare puts, but we have in our rule, in our playbook, so to speak, that we're not going to make any adjustments no matter what until we touch around the 190 level, and then we'll start to look to possibly make an adjustment, which who knows, that could happen tomorrow morning with the way that this market's going. So I think personally that we could be in for a down year this year, but let's look at this over the course of the grand scheme of things. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. This is America, folks. We've overcome the two. We've had two world wars. We've overcome Vietnam. We've overcome the Great Depression. We've overcome the SNL crisis of the '80s. We've overcome the flat market from 1966 to 1982. We've overcome the uh, real estate boom, the real estate bust. We've overcome the tech bubble busting. We've overcome uh, the credit crisis of a few years ago. We've overcome a lot of things in this country, folks, and even with all of those things that would have just wiped out any other country on the planet, most likely, we still have our S&P 500 that's averaged close to 10% throughout the history of our record keeping of it. So I want to emphasize that let's not lose track of the big picture. Should you be cautious in 2016? Good gosh, yes. But should you be cautious every year? Good gosh, yes. I want to just tell you, it, it's funny because of the fact that oftentimes that in the hedging space of my clientele, I have some clients where we're not looking to hedge so much. Maybe we're looking to leverage a little bit and some clients where we're looking to hedge. But in the hedging space, it's a very unpopular world. No matter what you do, you can never do anything right. Market goes up. Why are we bothering with this hedge? You, this is just terrible. Why? Do you? So, but if the market goes down, and even if you are only losing a percentage of the marketplace, well, you shouldn't be losing any money. You're hedging everything. Now, in reality, 99.9% .9 of my clients are not like that. But one thing that I struggle with, folks, is when I look at the portfolios and I see things like that, I often think like that. But I bring myself down to reality and I tell myself the things with which I've just said and realize that if you let yourself get too emotional with days like today or weeks like this week, you're going to drive yourself insane. So by reassuring yourself as to what the reality of this is, not just the four-day perception as to what has happened, that does help you to keep a greater cool on things. Now, most of those thoughts that I have that go into my head, I have a lot of psychological exercises with which I use, and they're typically gone within a few seconds. But everyone can fall victim to things like that, and you need to keep track of the big picture in order to keep your own sanity and to ultimately profit in the end. Here's the reality of it, folks. Let's say that you have a trading account and you end up making a million dollars over the course of 10 years, but you had a losing year in year two. I guarantee that when you go to a party and you say, yeah, I've made a million dollars over the last 10 years, they'll say, really? I bet you had a losing year, though. You say, yeah, I did have one losing year. You idiot. You are just the stupidest person I have ever met. I guarantee you no one will say that. Well, maybe Longo would, but with the exception of Longo, no one would say that. So make sure that you don't lose track of the big picture, folks, whether you're a bull, whether you're a bear, whether you're a short-term trader that got some credit spreads blown out today, whatever the case may be, you will live to trade another day so long as you don't blow out your account. Yes, I have been known to point out uh, a flaw or two. That is why I get paid. Uh, the big bucks at the end of the day. While you were talking, I was just looking to see kind of where this 2008 narrative uh, originated, and it seems like at least the earliest quote I could find that, that got a lot of play 
was from our old friend there, George Soros. No, someone who's certainly not afraid of making a hysterical quote every now and then. Uh, he said that the trouble, the current market troubles, reminded him of the crisis we had in 2008. So perhaps that's where all this snowball. I figured it had to start somewhere big because it's just they're beating that drum relentlessly. I know it makes for a good headline, but still, uh, it is kind of uh, it is kind of interesting. Granted, it has been a tumultuous four days. We of course have uh, China, the double whammy of China. We have the Middle East tensions rising. We have our friends over in North Korea saying, hey, don't forget about us, us too. <laughs> that certainly didn't help. Uh, there was that, some of that it seems to have been debunked now, whether it was indeed an H-bomb or just something else going on over there. Uh, but still, all of that kind of one, two, three, four punch really does kind of add up to a lot to start uh, the year off here. That said, Mr. Rock Lops, now we turn to you. First off, uh, hopefully you're not buying into this uh, 2008 debacle nonsense. And then B, what caught your eye and indeed the eyes of all of the collective goombas over there in the option pit chat room today uh just you know how big the sell-off's gonna be how to how to uh well out of profit from the sell-off basically that's kind of what we're looking at it's hard to believe uh, new year's eve was just what a week ago and the world didn't look so bad it looked weak but oh my gosh so yeah, a lot happens um, in, in a few days huh? <laughs> some uh long idea so the whole idea was I think the the problem with China is it's like I, I'm saying, you know, Mike's saying it's always pays to be cautious. It feels like the one-two punch of I generally to me, I think volatility like a market sell-offs kind of move in three. So you need you need kind of three things to really make the market sort of sell off. As in, okay, I have a geopolitical issue. I have, okay, the economy looks bad. I have China's devaluing the on. You need a few things to kind of start the um, to start the snowball down, and um, usually <laughs> one gets the volatility moving a little bit, market moves a little, then two, then three, and oil has kind of been all the way. Um, it's it's been it's been that issue the whole time, uh, at least for the last what six months. I mean, look at how long the oil as an issue has been for um, has been for the market. It's been like, what, a year now, right? Where, oh my gosh, um, the oil sell-off kind of hurt us at the end of 2014. It hurt us at the end of 2015. <clears throat> and low oil prices, I thought we're supposed to be, you know, the consumers are just, <laughs> they're not taking that money and going into Walmart with it, although Walmart's shown a little strength lately. Um, but that is, you know, low oil prices are actually starting to, un they have unsettled the credit markets to some degree. And then you had the, that hedge fund blowing out that caused a short-term spike. So uh, the market's already, I would say, on edge a little bit. Uh, so it won't take much for us to sell off some more. That's the simple, the simple thing. Now, if China apparently now, I believe I heard they were going to try to float their currency uh, which could be good, I think, right? They just kind of get out of the way. They're like, they're doing all this stuff about trying to uh, micromanage their currency. And you know, historically, that's never worked out for anybody, really. Um, and, you know, the Chinese stock market is trading at a 60 PE. Granted, their economy is growing at 7% a year, but, you know, it was trading at 100 PE. <laughs> so <clears throat> it's... There's plenty of stuff for people to worry about. Um, and I think, you know, realistically, you could you could just as easily see, a, you know, a, a rally tomorrow as a 2% sell-off. Now, I don't know what causes us to rally because there's so many kind of heavy factors, but the fact that maybe China floats and it's not really awful, um, I don't know really what that's – how the market is going to see that. So they're either going to really hate it or, you know, some of the volatility is going to be sapped out of the market pretty quickly. Um, that's the easy, the only thing I could really think of at this point. So, cause nothing really fundamentally is, is changed here uh, since we are at 2100 in the SPX, except for the fact that the fed's not going to do anything anymore. Uh, they're just going to say, okay, we're going to be, you know, they have to get rid of all the securities they own. I don't really know how that works. Maybe Tucson does. <laughs> but e either way, um, it's just right now, 
you're trading at a high, you know, VIX is, is at, uh, you know, it's in the mid 20s or the low 20s. So volatility begets volatility very fast. It takes very little for um, the liquidity to dry up, and that's what we got. So until that changes, and I don't know what the catalyst is to make it change, something good coming out of China, I think it's mostly just the Chinese have to give up to some degrees, let their market fall apart, and find some, you know, and just, you know, call it what it is. You know, they've been trying to hold it up and make it a <laughs> something great. A nationalistic thing to go buy stock, but I just think they're out of. I think they're out of time with it. Yeah, they are talking over there about. I think I think they're mentioning today about uh, perhaps doing away with those circuit breakers, which we always know that's perhaps not the best idea either. Sometimes a little bit of injection of cooler heads is just what the market is looking for. Of course, over there today, there were a lot of people complaining about how the circuit breaker was enacted. And you're right, that one uh, hedge fund over there in Shanghai getting a lot of play for liquidating the holdings. Only, at the end of the day, it's only about a $46 million hedge fund. I mean, that sounds big, but in the grand scope of things, it's it's pretty nominal, yet it got a lot of uh, ink about they had to liquidate all of their holdings. And that was a, that was a big deal over there on the news. Yeah, again, a lot of these things, a little bit of, uh, of tempest in a T-spot for some of these things. Of course, what wasn't, of course, like you mentioned, Andrew, was uh, the markets over here uh, still remaining uh, fairly robust from an overall volume perspective. Uh, liquidity still managing to hold up for the most part. Uh, and, and the big names, you get a little bit out there, you know, in the weeds, you're going to find some drier markets. But uh, in the main products, I mean, in fact, it's interesting. It took VIX kind of all week to really uh, break aggressively through its ADV, and it did that today. It's been averaging about 500,000 or so contracts a day. Uh, today, doing about 930,000 or right around there today. So it took uh, most of the week for it to really kind of do that. That uh, aggressive, uh, aggressive pop doing about three hundred sixty-seven thousand earlier this week. One day, uh, getting about six hundred thousand, uh, nearly seven hundred thousand yesterday. So yesterday being a, a decent day as well on the heels of the the much maligned atom bomb test there, and of course uh, the S and P either spy or SPX depending where you look. Also lighten it up today. Perhaps surprising a lot of people, not as perhaps put heavy as a lot of people might have thought, given just the uh, the headlines of the meltdown uh, you'd think today would be you know a 10 20 30 to 1 puts over calls a day and yet we didn't really see that uh, S and SPX about two and a half to one a spy about in the two to one range puts over calls today certainly puts leading the charge but not perhaps by the orders of magnitude you may have assumed. Of course, there were some names over here uh, taking some decent drubbings uh, in, in lieu of or perhaps in addition to what they're seeing out there in the marketplace for it, uh, taking it on the chin with some weak sales numbers compounding uh, everything else that's been going on out there and also probably getting the most headlines out there. Uncle Mike, your old stomping grounds of Apple, uh, south of the 100 handle. And we're not, we're not going we're not gonna count that little momentary aberration in August because that wasn't real. You couldn't really trade it for that long down there. And we were all joking here about uh, selling some juicy, I believe they were at 75 handle, maybe 70 handle puts out there. Uh, those bids vanished pretty quickly as well. So we won't count that momentary aberration down to about the 90 handle. That aside, this is really the first time it's broken back through the 100 handle since about October of 2014 so a lot of people a lot of hand wringing a lot of lamenting about that that of course well off their highs of uh, middle of last year or so uh, about 40 odd handles or so now i think closing today actually 96.45 out there in apple land so fairly aggressive uh, sell-off out there. What's interesting, too, a lot of people writing into us lament about this, and I was checking it out myself today, uh, because a lot of people, we haven't been playing south of 90 very long, so there aren't a lot of strikes to really choose from uh, in the weekly options in particular out there in the big fruit company. We're used to having pretty much every strike out there nicely handed to us and wrapped up in a bow for us to trade out there in Apple and at least in some of the weeklies, because we kind of just burst through this to the downside. Uh, it's every five handles, sometimes every two and a half handles. People are People want, they want more options, pun intended, uh, when they're out there trading in uh, Apple land. Uncle Mike, any of these movements out there in the big fruit company got you maybe stroking the chin and saying hmm again, or are you still uh, playing wait and see? I, I've been saying who, hmm since about 115. So uh, I, it's a good company. They have, they're a good fundamental company. I think with the sell-off that they're having right now, a lot of it has to do with, uh, I think I saw a statistic today, 23% of Apple's revenue or some, some, something in that neighborhood comes from China. 
And so when that's the case and China is a bad thing, I think that's a big reason as to why Apple's down 4% on the day when the S&P is only down 2.5%. That seems weird. I felt weird to say only 2.5%, but still. Uh, so it's definitely very tempting, uh, but I think I'm going to wait until after earnings to see if uh, – they can, and that's on the 26th. Or wait, oh, I'm sorry, it's Mark Longo here. Earnings are tomorrow on Apple, folks. Um, uh, and to see if they maybe have some reason with which to do something innovative, because once again, what drove Apple up is that they had world changing innovation. And until they have that world changing innovation again, uh, it's not going to happen. Yeah, takes uh, some doing. Of course, it is kind of funny. We talk about all these other stocks out there, you know, the Facebooks, the Amazons, the Googles. And you look at them like in the diehard fundamentalist view of one Andrew Giovinazzi. It is kind of funny to see this stock just getting hammered with a P.E. south of 11, 10.9 right now. You know, we talk about Amazon a lot here on the show. 918 is their P.E. out there. And they've been able to, to skate on that for over a decade now. It's kind of amazing. Uh, Google even with about a 36 uh, P.E. right now. And, of course, Apple crossed the... 200 billion level in cash last year in midsummer, I believe. Of course, it doesn't take into account about 50 odd billion they have in debt floating around. There's still buck 50 and billion in cash. I think most people would take that. That's a decent amount. And I see differing breakdowns of how that breaks down per share for them, somewhere in the three to seven or so dollar per share range. Uh, but still interesting stuff. You know, we always malign Apple on here, but uh, from a fundamentalist perspective, uh, you, you know, it kind of makes it hard to, to, to talk about others like Amazon and stuff. Was Apple a big topic of discussion in the old pit chat today, Mr. Rock Lobster? It is the 100 level and why it's going down and why it's <laughs> for right now. Like Tucson said, it's not a growth company. It's a I mean, it. It, it is, but it isn't. They have one product, and it generates a lot of revenue. And you know, we were talking about what what could make Apple BlackBerry again because it's happened once before to them in their history. And uh, you think about it now, you're like, no, that's not possible. You know, but they they've got 500 million phone users or something like a big number. So they they are going to generate a lot of money from that base. Uh, and it's you know now Apple, what do they do with all the money? And they need some innovation. They're just you know, there hasn't been anything except for bigger iPhones. And that that actually helped Apple, I guess, from what was it? Uh, it was seven for one split adjustment helped Apple go from 400 to 100, just like bigger phones. But, you know, all of a sudden, you know, they've sold that a bunch of those. And now we're sitting here um, and it's besides kind of, you know, reselling to their user base, you know, which it has a little bit of growth. It just doesn't have a whole lot of growth in it anymore. So it's it's hard to get really excited about it from a fundamental point of view, but you could fundamentally would have could have bought it at 110 and 105 and 115 and pick every number, you know, south of 135, which is where it was not very long ago. So I don't, I have, I I, I think, when they actually start making something again, uh, the iWatch clearly has not done it. Um, they they all start the growth engine going again, but right now it's I think it's more like a really really massively well run utility. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. The Apple utility. We'll have to leave it on that there, listeners. Send your hate mail uh, to Andrew at optionpit.com as we keep on rolling into the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, everybody. Welcome back to The Odd Block. If you're not familiar with the premise, this is indeed the portion of the show where we take a little bit of a walk on the wild side from an options perspective, dig into some of the weirder, the more bizarre, the more head-scratching. You think Uncle Mike is scratching his chin about Apple? We're scratching our chin about all of our candidates all the time in the odd block. And of course, like I mentioned at the top of the show, this is kind of just the tip of the iceberg. We do a lot of unusual activity over there on the website as well. So if you want to read more details on these or any of the past ones we talked about or additional alerts you don't have time to get to on the show, surf on over to the mothership, theoptionsinsider.com. You can find all of that and a lot more. And hey, it's all free. So 
check it out for your reading and trading pleasure. Going to kick things off in the land of the home builders, in particular, the good old Spider S&P Home Builders ETF, ticker symbol XHB, closing today about $31.61, off about a full handle or a little over 3%. For this name, and this is the name that does fairly decent volume, about 9,000 contracts a day, doing about 3x that today, about nearly a little over 26,000 uh, today on the day, and about 28 to 1 calls over puts. That should tell you where we're focusing our attention and or our concern, depending on how you view this kind of stuff. Now we're kicking things off here. Out in the Feb expiration cycle, in particular, the Feb monthlies, Feb 35, 36, looks like a bit of a vertical going up there today. When we started profiling it, about 9,000 on the 36s paper buying, or excuse me, 35s paper buying, and about 13,000 on the 36s paper, it looks like paper selling. Uh, as the day went on, that ratio went up a little bit more, about 10,000 by 15,000 total, all opening, no open interest really to speak of on any of these strikes. It looks like we got a funky vertical one and a half to one going up on our traditional ratio spread. A bit of an interesting choice here, uh, you know, uh, a one handle spread. Granted, he's not uh, he's not really doing it for, uh, for a heck of a lot at all. So he's kind of a bit of a flyer on here and he obviously chose his strikes to line up that way. But still, you know, uh, a one handle spread Kind of an interesting one to do a ratio on. Mr. Rock Lobster, kick us off here uh, for our second show of 2016. What's your take on a, a one and a half to one upside call vertical in XHB? Does that thing, does that trade make any sense to you at all? Uh, from a, maybe just from a pure cheap <laughs> price perspective, that's about all I could, other than that, no. I mean, wh why would you, why would you do a vertical like this so tight? Give yourself some room to run if you're going to do it. It's a one point vertical for that's going to cost you a nickel and you can do it 15,000 by 10,000. It, it's, I, I don't get it. <laughs> I guess, I guess somebody wanted to just, you know, cause it's pretty far out of the money for XHB. So I, it's a, I, I guess it can work, but oh my gosh. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I just, I just don't get it. We're having shades of uh, men's warehouse here, uh, but this one makes even less sense <laughs> when you think about well, it. Well, <laughs> the thing with, I mean, okay, men's warehouse, you know, we knew it was a back spread. Okay. And the stock has to move a lot for it to work. That's, that's fine. Um, but I mean, this is a whole nother, you know, the potential here is okay. A XHB has to make a power move up to 35 and it can stop at 36. That's kind of like, to me, that's a little William Telville, you know, you know, you're splitting the apple with a arrow. <laughs> yeah, it's got to explode to the upside, but just enough, just enough for this trade to make for you to make your dollar <laughs> and, or 95 cents or whatever. And now, then the funny stop. thing was, and I think maybe he's looking at charts like, well, XHB before all, you know, at the end of 2014 was right around 35 trading 36. So, I mean, that that ETF is off 10 percent. So so. I can see how you they might be diagonalizing that and think, you know, we just make a recovery, that all this stuff with China is a bunch of junk, which it, it totally could be. But um, anyway, that's that's what I see there with that. Yeah, this could be a bit of a repair trade. Usually you see those on a two-to-one ratio, not one-and-a-half to one. This guy could have a reason why he's – that's the only way this kind of makes any – Logical sense, really, is that you're right. This thing has sold off quite a bit. Uh, he's looking to uh, readjust his price levels and get a little bit better, and that's what the repair trade can do for you, uh, listeners. But still, yeah, it's um, lower his break even a little bit. The ratio is still kind of off for that. So uh, either way, it's a bit of a head scratcher, and we like to we like to talk about those here on the old odd block. Let us know, listeners, why would you ever do a one point vertical one and a half to one times on a ratio uh, outside of the repair? strategy kind of mindset as we move on into our next victim it wouldn't be the odd block if we didn't have a, a cheapy bio stock a biotech stock or perhaps a cheapy energy stock we got the latter for you today listeners this one is our old friend we talked about these a few times recently console energy inc ticker symbol cnx 
this guy trading for a lofty $7.27 at the end of the session today. So south of our sub $10. Coming up on the $5 handle pretty soon. This is a name that does just shy of 10,000 contracts a day. Doing about exactly that much again today. So it wasn't overall volume that caught our eye, although it was pretty heavily skewed in one direction, about 8.5 to 1 calls over puts. This gets to a question we maybe maybe get to a little bit later about trading and some of these cheapy names, what goes on in these. And sometimes we do see this kind of one-sided paper. We saw it again today. It was all calls all the time. In particular, a little bit longer on the old training spectrum all the way out to Jan of 2018. Yes, you heard me right, listeners. Two years hence. It sounds like it's it's deep into the mists of the future. 2018, of course, we're already in 2016. That sounds pretty pretty futuristic in and of itself. And we saw the Jan 2018 nine-handle calls going up for a whopping $3.10 our friend paid here uh, for two, do- two years swing at the bat on the nine strike. He did it 5,000 times. Uh, not much open interest to speak of, as you might probably assume for that far out of a, of a contract on this cheapy name. So our friend here kind of loaded it all up, all went up in one block, Over there on the old ARCA. Didn't see any stock going up with this. Doesn't mean he didn't maybe have some stock at a different time or something else like that. Or perhaps he's seeing this trade as a bit of a surrogate or it wouldn't be a replacement because he didn't really do the stock today. But it could be a bit of a stock surrogate in his mind uh, in terms of why load up on the stock when I could do this. Of course, there are some people on the Viceroy when he was on the show, for example, would uh, look askance at uh, loading up on a $3 option in a $7 name. But that's a conversation for another day. Mr. Rock Lobster, lots of size, far off calls in a cheapy energy name. What's your take here on uh, on these upside swing for the fences here in CNX? Well, it, I guess it could recover, <laughs> but look at how far out somebody's going now. 2018. So... Yeah, we've seen a lot of call rights out pretty far. I haven't seen many call buys out that far of late. Everyone seems like they're going out to harvest some yield. This guy is saying, I'm going to gobble up some premium that far out. Yeah, I, I think they're, you know, it's, um, uh, it, it really, really looks like, okay, well, the energy sector is going to recover at some point, and I'm just going to buy some calls out there and you look at console energy and like, okay, they're looking, okay, well, two years ago, where was it? Um, I believe that that stock actually had some value at one point. Uh, it, yeah. A year ago it was $34. And, um, and I, what are they natural gas producer? And they just been kind of getting shellacked here lately. They've had some write downs and they're like, okay, I'll just going to go, you know, three bucks. You know, if I have an $18 stock, that's fine. Now the stock is only seven dollars right now, so I mean you gain you gain something going out to twenty eighteen. They're not paying a dividend anymore, so there's no point in really buying the stock. Um, so it it makes a lot more sense. It gives you twenty sixteen, twenty seventeen, and right into January of twenty eighteen. So you know you could see a recovery. I mean, uh, as early as September, but you need oil to probably get back or gas prices to get back up there. A it, it it's reasonable. Um, it's a it's a definitely it's a reasonable trade, but again you're looking for like fifteen sixteen bucks. Um, I remember a trade like that actually in Hewlett Packard. I had a client who had stock, and this was when I guess Hewlett was like two years ago or three years ago when it got totally smoked out, and they were long a lot of stock. And I go, well, you don't want to get rid of it. Uh, I go, so why don't you just buy some two-year leaps, uh, you know, because the volatility was super cheap. Nobody cared about it anymore. But they could get, you know, three times the delta for the same amount of money uh, with the leaps, and it ended up working out really good um, because Hewlett Packard made a recovery back to about 35 or something like that. So they made all their money back and a bunch more. Uh, So they didn't want to get rid of it. They just thought it would recover eventually. But they're trying to jack it up. So th- that could certainly be what somebody's doing here. They're just trying to say, you know what? I'm just going to double down. Um, I've, I'm not, I own it. I'm not, I'm going to sell it. Maybe take the tax loss, roll into some calls. I mean, Tucson would know more about the tax loss thing, but they roll into some calls, twice as many deltas and see what happens. 
Yeah, you know, the dividend thing does change the spectrum a little bit. You're right. It doesn't make the stock as attractive. Because otherwise, on a, you know, on a net delta basis, you might be. On an outlay per delta basis, you might be better off just buying the stock, particularly if you can get it on margin. Uh, your net outlay for the stock is going to be about 360, 370 uh, versus 310 for the calls. So uh, maybe that might be a little bit more attractive to you and you actually own the stock. Uh, of course, there's other things to consider when you're doing it on a margin basis. But still, yeah, the lack of a dividend doesn't make that as attractive. But some people might still say I'd rather have that thing that is mine in perpetuity rather than these calls that become ephemeral after two years. But that's uh, that's a conversation for another day as we roll on into our final victim here on the old odd block. These are, this is, uh, I believe, a newcomer here, Weatherford International PLC. Another cheapy name. This one, ticker symbol WFT. Uh, trading today, closing about $7.34, off about $0.60 cents or about 7%. So not a great day uh, for this name either. This name does about 13,000 uh, contracts a day, doing just a tick under 70,000 today. Puts over calls 180 to 1, listeners, and that should give you a bit of a hint of where our final name was spending most of their time. It was in the Feb and March expiration cycles, in particular one side of the option chain that really caught our eye. It started lighting it up this morning with a 20,000, actually I think it was all just one, it went three blocks separately, but uh, pretty much one trade of the Feb 7-8 put spread going up against, looks like, or with, I should say, actually, the March 6 puts. Looks like paper selling out of their eight puts about 20,000 times and then loading up with about 20,000 of the Feb 7 puts. And then also, for good measure, picking up, let's see exactly how many, it's about 22,000 of the March 6 puts. Opening on the March, no open interest really there to speak of. About 24,000 open on the Feb 8 puts, which looks like that's why we think they're closing on that position and then rolling on down to a strike. Also very heavy open interest, 41,000 on the Feb 7 puts. A bit of an odd one here as well, but not that when you look at where the stock is trading, not perhaps too much of a head scratch or wanting to perhaps get a little bit more, a little bit more out of the money strike, take the eight handle off the table. And also for good measure, pick up a little bit more downside, a little bit farther out, out there in the March time frame. Mr. Rock Lobster, take us home here on this bit of a funky three-way, uh, splitting up his put love amongst Feb and March here in Weatherford. Yes, I think they're, they, they made some money in their puts, uh, a bunch, and they're saying, okay, I'm just going to spread it out. I'm going to do a little Feb. It looks like I'll do a little March. Didn't go up spread, but it all went up at the same time. And uh, they're going to take their, uh, they're going to take that money and and buy more puts with it and see what happens. So, uh, kind of hard. It's kind of hard to argue with it when it looks, uh, you know, like they were really right. <laughs> and Weatherford, I believe, is just another driller, uh, oil services and stuff, and they're just they are struggling like every all the other ones are, just with no. Um, there's just no uh, the backlog, the book, everything they're trying to do just looks everything just looks bad. So I guess that's uh, that's what that's what they got. Uh, just a just a rough it's a rough deal. A rough deal, anyway. You slice it, listeners. And we went a little long on the whole trading block today, listeners. But there was a lot to talk to talk about i should say as you might imagine so i think you'll forgive us i think we can squeeze in maybe one or two questions from you guys though so without further ado let's dive right on into the mail block it's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails tweets facebook messages website comments and much more it's time for the mail block all right everybody welcome to the mail block here. You guys know the drill. E emails, tweets, Facebook messages, t all that fun stuff. Post a comment or uh, leave a, something on the feedback form on the website. No shortage of ways for you guys to do all that, and a lot of that's baked into the app as well. well let's get right into it here. First one from Charlie C. This one I surfaced uh, because <laughs> it's just kind of funny. Uh, we in Jan This January, it was nine years here of the Options Insider and indeed our radio network. In that nine-year history, 
Uh, I literally never can recall no questions about second-order Greeks in the entirety on the website, on the radio, and then in the last month or two, we get a couple of them rolling in. It kind of makes me wonder, maybe, uh, was there a book out there about second-order Greeks, or did someone do a webinar about these somewhere, or a newsletter, or something? All of a sudden, people seem to have second-order Greeks on the brain. Uh, Charlie C. asking, do second-order Greeks have any relevance uh, for retail traders? Well, I'd encourage you guys to check out our recent episode of the Option Block back, uh, 478 actually it was, and title was, what the hell are second-order Greeks? So uh, that might be a good uh, one for you guys to check out for your listening pleasure in its entirety if you want to just check out that section uh, where we do on the it was on the mail block about second order greeks uh, they are interesting stuff we kind of talked about their relevance or perhaps lack thereof <laughs> for a retail guy uh, i don't know uncle mike in all of your uh, put rolling and adjusting have you ever stopped and stroked your chin and said hmm let me check out the second order greeks on these positions before i adjust this put spread for one of your clients you can't say that i ever have to tell you the truth um Interesting. I'm curious to see what you guys think of it, but I'll be honest with you. It's something that I've never uh, really spent too much time on. I think that gives you your answer right there, <laughs> listeners. Yeah, we haven't really touched on the network that much, except for that one time. Maybe because people are, seem to have these on the brain, maybe we'll do a little bit more of a deeper dive in these, maybe on, on a boot camp or something like that coming up, because people seem to have these on the brain. Andrew, we kind of went deep on these recently. We kind of decided that, you know, unless... Your uh, portfolio manager, risk manager, or market maker, and even then it's only in kind of some extreme circumstances, that most active retail guys would be much better off really getting a firm grasp on the four main Greeks, Delta, Gamma, Theta, Vega. Maybe if you want to throw a row in there, maybe. But the primary four, definitely getting a good mastery of those and how they interrelate and the, you know, the playoff between Gamma and Vega and a calendar spread and, and things like that before they really start, uh, start scratching their heads about the, uh, the second order Greeks. Is that still your take, sir? Um, I have a client actually who I've been working with who's built a pretty cool spreadsheet uh, for uh, looking at Edge and using uh, uh, Vanna and Voma and um, to do some uh, uh, to lose to do some forward uh, you know some forward estimating about volatility and how a position is going to move. So I actually you know I I do have a client. He's kind of he's pretty advanced guy, um, pretty smart. So, and I, I, I'm finding it very, I'm finding it useful, uh, for just trying to figure out how a, a trade is going to act when we're putting on like butterflies and stuff like that. So it's, so I would say, yes, there is, there is a place for it. Uh, however, it's like, kind of like a loaded gun. You better know how to use it. Like it's, that's the easiest way. <laughs> so your, your client is bringing you to the dark side, eh? Uh, a little bit, but you know, it's, I think it's overall, it'll be, it'll be a good thing. It'll be a good thing. Yeah. I mean, cause I, you, probably in your days, certainly as a market maker, you didn't really have time. <laughs> and even now, you know, in your days later as an educator and mentor, I'd imagine second order Greeks, probably not really raising their ugly head too many times there, but you never know when an esoteric client may take you to the dark side. Maybe he is the dark side because the new star Wars movie, they're the first order, right? So the second order would clearly be the next stage of evil and dark side in the universe let's do one more quick one here uh we got one from uh 777 kind of relevant what we're just talking about today it says how do you adjust your options trading for cheap stocks below ten dollars well we just kind of outlined a couple of cheapies in the odd block that's kind of a frequent occurrence in that portion of the show uh, and as you can see you know from the names we highlight there tends to be sometimes when those things blow up, there is a lot of one-sided paper in those names. It's something you have to watch out for. But 99.9% .9 of the time, most of those names are going to be really thin and really lightly traded. So, you know, the same caveats that apply to thin names are going to apply to a lot of these cheap names uh, because they're just going to be very wide. So you have to really you have to really want to get into something out there. You have to really babysit it and work it. And the chances of someone stepping up mid-market or even close to that to fill you are pretty small because they have no incentive to because no one else is trading out there. So that's kind of the thing to typically worry about with a lot of these names. And also the fact that, like we said before, a lot of people just just are dismissive of the entire notion of trading options on a sub $10 name, let alone a sub $5 name, because that pretty much uh, that stock is an option at that point. Uh, but still, uh, you know, it, it's something worthy to note. Uncle Mike, I know you don't tend to play in the cheapy realm that often, but uh, what's your thoughts on any adjustments you might make for, uh, for a sub $10 option or stock, I should say, as well as 
in general, the whole debate of cheap stock versus options? I, in, I, not a fan. So I would say if you are going to buy the stock, like we've talked about this on the show, why not just buy the stock? Now, granted, you can create leverage by using the options. And from a scalability standpoint, you can make the argument that it's just the same thing, just with more contracts from a risk reward standpoint. But I think that the problem that you run into is number one, uh, you have the uh, cheap stock issue. But number two, you're going to have wider spreads on a lot of those things most of the time. So I would say that I'm typically a fan of just buying the stock, holding it, seeing what happens. It's a, it's, it's ten dollars, and if you don't like that idea, don't buy that many shares of it. So in that last example we just talked about with that seven dollar and fifty cent name, someone spending close to fifty percent of the stock for a two, two, two year out nine handles, so like you know twenty percent out of the money call. Uh, you would not, uh, you don't condone that sort of trading. You know why not just buy it on margin? If that's the case, because you can still you're still getting the same thing. Now, yes, I know that you have twice the risk of it when buying on margin. But I think that I normally I'm not a fan of buying on margin. But if you're really that bullish on something, I would suggest using leverage along those lines instead. Um, you know, the only thing I would suggest, is just make sure you have your stop losses in place and be careful along those lines. But my first choice would be to avoid something like that. But if I had to choose between the two, I would say buy it on margin if your broker will let you buy a stock that cheap on margin. Yeah, that's the other caveat there. Some brokers won't really margin or they get really expensive and restrictive on some of those cheap names. So that's uh, It may not be the straight up 50% you've come to know and love with some of the bigger, more liquid names. Mr. Rock Lobs, you take us home. Your thoughts on any personal adjustments you make for trading these, these cheapy names? Uh, the only adjustment is really just how volatility trades. That's the big one um, because – 100 volatility and a cheapy name is not very much. Just remember that. Um, that, would be my, that would be my big one. But it's so tempting to just sell those calls when the stock's $3 and you get a 237 vol. That's just that's yes, free money, yes, isn't it? Yes, it is. However, however. <laughs> oh, wait, but the 237 vol translates into $0.08. Cents, so maybe it isn't as good of a trade as <laughs> exactly. I thought. Exactly. Volatility doesn't mean near as much uh, at that level. That's for sure. Now, let's revisit this for a second now. Chesapeake Energy, that's a stock that's a pretty solid name for the most part. <clears throat> Not that I'm a fan of it by any means, but that's just the first one that came to my head that's a cheapie. Uh, but if you're bullish on oil and you want to take a really speculative gamble on oil and natural gas... That one might not be a bad way to go. We did a trade on the odd block a, a few weeks ago, and I forget what it was, but it was somebody that was uh, selling. They did a – they bought – like the $5 puts and they sold three times as many $2 puts or something along those lines to where the, the only way the trade would be bad is if Chesapeake went to $1 or something along those lines. Yep. And I'm just thinking about that. That would be a consideration with which it might make sense to do it. If it is a company that's really gotten pounded and you're really bullish on it and you're okay with taking on the stock at $1, but I'm guessing that the person who did that trade does not do many adjustments on it. They're just fine owning the stock at a dollar if indeed it comes to that. Yeah, it was the it was five thousand by fifteen thousand, you're right, of the uh five by two five by two Jan uh, put spread. So fifteen thousand of the Jan five puts and five thousand of the two puts. It went up about a month and a half ago. I don't I don't know if it's this month this Jan, in which case it's out. Or if it was, uh, I'll have to look and see the exact. It looks like it was straight up Jan, so it's already it's already out there. Uh, but yeah, and just interesting one. There are some funky ways. I mean, we're not poo pooing it entirely, but uh, don't uh, don't forget about stock, particularly stock on margin at that level. That may be a more attractive thing, and you do have the risk profile of margin and the cost associated with it, and probably be more expensive to do it on a cheap name. But that may, at the end of the day, having that may be a more attractive prospect. All right, let's keep on rolling into our final segment. Time for around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, everybody. Of course, uh, we've got the world ending on everyone's mind. So pretty much everyone's going to get out of bed uh, tomorrow morning or even late tonight, see what the Chinese market is doing and see what the futures are looking at and then kind of go from there. So that's kind of where the lion's share, I think, of the interest is. 
Uh, aside from that, so we do have some numbers coming out for uh, the Fed, but no, I don't think anyone really is uh, too concerned about uh, uh, about uh, about the Fed doing another dance anytime soon, given all the recent turmoil that's going off and the fact they're coming off the heels of their first raise in quite some time. Of course, we do have earnings on the horizon as well. Maybe if you want to dare to cast your eye domestically, uh, Alcoa kicking it off next week, so we'll be looking forward to a little bit of action perhaps there and something more tangible to focus on rather than the vague threats of a hydrogen bomb on North Korea, the vague notion of rising tension in the Middle East, or the very nebulous what the hell is going on over in China question. A lot of people are still scratching their heads over. That said, let's turn our attention to you. Uh, Let's start in the hinterlands this time. Mr. Rock Lobster, what are you keeping an eye on for the rest of the week into the weekend? Uh, I'm keeping an eye on... What happens overnight? Because it seems like overnight roulette right now. Are we up? Are we down? (laughs) I have no idea. Uh, What I have seen is a lack of rally overnight. That is definitely, we seem to be able to drop pretty hard. We don't seem to be able to rally pretty hard. So I'm guessing uh, all that is going to pretty much stay the same. So, um, (coughs) you know, we'll see. If we can actually get anything to uh, uh, to happen there, but I'm I doubt that we're gonna. S- I actually, I shouldn't say that. I I would be surprised if we didn't have another one to two percent move tomorrow somehow, somehow, some way, some shape or form. Yeah, that cer- yes. certainly seems like we're, that's where the way things are setting up. Uncle Mike, we turn to you. What are you watching? I'm guessing it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, no, I'm I'm watching Dollar General. No, just kidding. No, I, it's along with everything you said. With uh, it's funny when non-farm payrolls are coming out tomorrow, and that's probably normally the highlight of my morning on the first Friday of the month is to see how 7:30 in the morning, check out my phone and see what's going on with the futures. But uh, in reality, that's going to be I think that's going to be kind of a non-issue at this point with what's going on in China and everything else. So. We'll see. So I guess just all the macro news of the world to see how we shape up going into this earnings season. And just when we thought we were done with the macro madness, I know in our final shows of last year, we were all kind of lamenting what could possibly be happening in the near future, at least until earnings season kicks off. Seemed like we had a a tranquil month or half, three quarters of a month ahead of us or so. And then pretty much out of the gate, the market reminding us that there's a lot of unknown unknowns still lurking out there for us to pay attention to all right and that music means it's time for the close of yet another episode thrilling episode of the option block but before we go as always and check back in with my cohorts here my partners in crime see what they have cooking that may interest you starting off in the hinterlands with the rock lobster what's cooking in the land oh the pit uh, we have a fixing broken trade class on January 23rd. Go to option pit forward slash events for our Saturday class. And we guarantee you will learn something. You will learn something about interesting ways to look at positions, adjusting if you're kind of stuck. And uh, and hopefully you find it very useful, which usually our clients do. I like that. A learning guarantee. We guarantee you learn something. People have money back guarantees, and Uncle Mike has his famous 48% guarantee. You have a learning guarantee. I like that. I do. You will learn something. Could be an options vocabulary word. You never know, but you'll learn something. You'll learn what Vanna and Voma are if you stick around. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Take care. All right. And Uncle Mike, what's cooking in the land of RCM? Information on the book is going to be coming out in the next week or two. I know I promised the first of the year this year, but uh, with markets doing what they've been doing, I've held off a little bit on it. I ran into a couple of snags, but nonetheless, we should have information on it coming soon. Uh, Also, if you have any questions about what we're doing to hedge portfolios or how we're trying to protect ourselves in these markets, feel free to call me at any time, 312-212-3531, or feel free to send me an email, mtosaw at rcmfs.com. And finally, Monday night, we got the big game between the Oklahoma Sooners and the Clemson Tigers. We will see who wins. That's the other thing that we have on Around the Block. It will be exciting. I never thought about this, but the title Go Long may not resonate with people right now. Maybe long-term bullish, short-term cautious may be a better better title for right now. There you go. (laughs) Little title switcheroo over there. Keep an eye out for Uncle Mike's book coming soon to Amazon and other outlets. And on behalf of Uncle Mike and The Rock Lobster and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing to the show and, of course, for sending in such great questions. 
Keep them coming, and we'll see you next time right here on the Option Block. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 